Right. Uh, what's happening, people? Uh, my name is Bruce, also known as Cymatic Bruce. Uh, I've been in the, the VR game for this past half decade or so. I'm great. Uh, and welcome to SVVR Meetup number 54. Uh, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. This is fun. Um, so this is uh, sweet. So we have all of you here in real life. It's a typical July meetup. Uh, it's a little nice and cozy. Nothing wrong with that. We're gonna get all nice and intimate here. Um, and we also have a few people say, hey, what's up in the portal hanging out in high fidelity? Oh my gosh. Oh, he's using the force, I see. Very good. Oh, that's that's something else. That is not the force at all. Um, so, uh, we're going to jump right into it. We have a couple of presentations, which will be pretty cool. And then it's gonna be some uh, fellowshipping, some communing, some ideas, exchanging. Uh, some demos I'll be having, so it'll be uh, good stuff. So, welcome to another SVVR meetup. So, uh, first off, just gonna kick right into the presentations with um, Mark Morrison here uh, from FS Studio. And I don't know what FS Studio does, so we're gonna find out right now. Let's give a warm welcome. Just a little closer. Okay, so hello. Thank you guys. <coughs> How's everybody doing this summer? You guys doing good? Are you guys working? Is everybody working or are you on vacation? Vacation. <laughs> workation. Yeah. I'm gonna do a little bit more talking with slides, don't worry about that. Um, thank you all. I really appreciate being here and first time I'm in this, this space. It's a really awesome space. So thank you, Carl, Nana, and, and Bruce. Um, I'm Mark Morrison and real quick background. I've done a lot of video game work and I was at Unity for about three years and startups doing AR, VR. Um, today I'll use the acronym XR. I'm not really a big acronym guy. I wish we could just decide on one and keep it, but I guess we keep evolving that. So uh, I always like to find out who's a developer, like who's in the room, who's development, business. Uh, by show of hands, how many are developers? Cool. And how many are business people? And how many are owners of businesses? Cool. So it's a nice mix. So um, I live local, and I met uh, the SVVR crew a long time ago when I was at Unity. Huge, huge kudos. I mean, I can't tell you how important it is to build community. And so I'm here today. I'm going to be fairly short, although I'll take a few more minutes because I think our, our one of our presenters is in transit or is, is not able to make it. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about FS Studio, but I'd love to answer, uh, even ask you questions, but I won't do that now, but answer any questions. And um, let's see, I think I'll do this right. So uh, I kind of hacked together a little bit of an intro here. And, I'm sure our CEO is looking for me to refine this, but we are uh, an advanced, we're, we're actually an advanced technology studio. <clears throat> and I say advanced technology because we're out there looking for the kind of work that we do is with bigger companies, bigger projects, or subbing with bigger teams and bigger projects to solve technology problems. And when I say technology problems, I'm gonna, I'm gonna race pretty quickly through um, to some use cases and some projects that we've done. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure you guys hear me. <clears throat> so, we're based in Emeryville. This is a company that was founded in 2011 by a number of developers. They all had you know, really deep backgrounds working for other companies. But that was about the time when I started getting into immersive technology, specifically AR and then VR pretty quickly. And FS Studio is, is based in Emeryville. We have a studio workshop um, on Alameda, um, which is a great place. I don't know if you guys have been up there. I haven't spent a lot of time there. <clears throat> but I went there recently, and we've actually got a stage where we built some, some bigger projects, pro uh, hardware and software. So we, like most of you out there, are independent, always looking for work. How many out, out there are looking for work today, work for higher projects? Anybody? So that's good. You guys have all got projects you're working on your own. So there's a lot of us in this space now, and you'll hear about this in deeper discussions about, like, where's the work? Where's the money? And I wanted to add a little bit of value today to today's presentation, and this is where I'll take some questions. You know, where is the work? Where is the money? Because we're a fir firmly based in the work for higher spectrum. You know, we build some of our own stuff, but we leverage that thing back into clients' work. So we're really focused on a couple of uh, specific areas. 
And right now, coming out of our experience with IoT and embedded systems, we're really focused on XR. And XR, as we see it, is really an umbrella over a lot of the immersive technology slash connected experiences that we're getting out there in the marketplace. A lot of it is enterprise and industrial, so we as consumers and, and audience won't see that always. But that's something to think about. I would say that the majority of the work that we get and the things that we do are in the enterprise and industry space. They're not in the entertainment space, but we love that. We love that area as well. So um, I'm gonna kind of race through this too, because I don't have a ton of time. I mean, we, we do focus on a lot of stunt work stuff. That's where we find work as well. People are trying to figure out and scrap through their ideas to basically get a big check cut at their company. So we work on a lot of different um, proofs of concepts and things like that. And again, just adding a little value here for those of you who are looking for work for hire, it takes time and it takes networking, but it also does in this day and age take a little bit of trial by error and kind of letting people get some of your attention and your bandwidth and building the trust. For me, it's all about trust. Business is about a trusting relationship and confidence in actually getting the work and, and executing on the work. So we do a lot of the obvious stuff that you would think a company like an advanced technology group would do. Um, you know, we work on a lot of computer vision solutions, um, have a very deep history in IoT as far as IoT definition is, in terms of the embedded systems, both on the, the hardware and the software side making that work. Uh, again, I'm going to race through pretty quickly and not read things to you. We do a lot of the, the services stuff, but an, another, another piece, you know, anecdotal to, to finding work for hire, if you target yourself and kind of, if we, if we went out there and just looked for game development work, it would be difficult. There's a lot of game developers. And as you get the artwork and the production work, that's great work. We love that work, but we like to have that inside of bigger projects. And so these are some of the things that we've done. Um, and I'll, I won't read, but I'll just kind of walk you through a few of these projects where we found really good bigger partners who keep coming back for more work. And a lot of it is understanding the client. So we'll come in with LeapFrog and understand not only the products, because a lot of us have kids and we have the products, but what they're trying to accomplish by evolving what they've got. So this was this has been a great relationship and, and we've done a lot of work with them uh, in terms of exploring uh, new products and ways to kind of improve. It really comes down to business and marketing, kind of traction in the consumer space. So also while a lot of us are technical and focused on the technology, there's a big portion of it that comes down to, to building that trust that I talk about, kind of people understanding that you know what they're talking about, what they're dealing with. Um, porting is a huge business now. So a lot of you out there are probably in the same space where there's a great solution proprietarily in one sector, but they're trying to get that out across channel or across platforms. When I was at Unity, I was there for three years, I helped build their games business up and help create the community there and some of the processes that they still use. And the biggest value to Unity and why Unity I think is such a big success and so meaningful in our space development wise is their number one priority is all the developers out there, all of the customers. And that's something that's super old school. So I really appreciate that. Unreal does the same thing and they kind of caught on very quickly that this was part of the secret sauce for Unity. But porting for us is a, is a meaningful business and we like to do that and we like to work with other people too. By the way, we always look for talent. So if there are contractors out there, we're always looking for technical artists, we're always looking for systems folks, Linux system stuff. So you know, feel free if you're ever wondering and looking for some work, uh, we're, we're always looking for you. Um, this is another company that probably most of you all know. Um, this is a, a pretty big toy company. They do a lot of things in, in, in our immersive technology space now, trying to get not only into the living room, but even outdoors and doing things with, uh, you know, their air hogs is what we worked on. Um, so, as you see this, you'll, you know, we've also done some work with Hasbro. We have done a lot of toy work, and that's a good place to explore as well, because it's fun to work in, you can get paid, and you can then leverage that stuff out into other kind of more real, real world applications. Uh, automotive and robotics is, is a real, you know, hot topic these days and there's a lot of problems to be solved. That's the other thing, you know. Are we, as producers and developers, solving problems? And it's kind of cliche as we talk about this a lot, but if we're not solving a problem out there that needs to be solved, it's 
really difficult to exist and sustain yourself as we do as, as a development shop, you know, as developers. Um, this was a really neat project that we did. We've got a, ra a ride that we built on our stage up in Alameda, and it, uh, it's, it's a concept piece that was done, um, it's called Fictional Forest, and it basically uses uh, a lot of the Star Wars world, and it's, it's a, a fairly uh, deep, immersive experience on a, on a motion stage, and there's a lot of sensory stuff going on. But we, we worked on a Saber Battles game, and this one was fairly successful in terms of um, how, how it came out. And we worked, we worked with, uh, you know, with the company that we worked with, we, we spent a lot of time understanding the problem they have and trying to solve that problem. <clears throat> we do a lot of work in the HCI world, um, and that's, you know, the human-computer interaction. There's a great presentation, if you can find it online, that Timothy West from Unity has given. I don't see her giving it that much anymore, but it's, it's kind of the allegory of the beginning of HCI as we know it. Um, and I'll date myself. Uh, I was around when we kind of reinvented the arrow, you know, the mouse and the keyboard. So starting from that point coming forward, you know, we had this real renaissance with the touch screens. I wanted to throw this out there too, because I think about it a lot. What will the future HCI be? And I don't think we even think about that now because 10 or 20 years from now, as we really have massively adopted immersive technology in the home and away from the home, inside and outside, getting rid of all these friction points like light traffic and different things like the, you know, the position tracking that we're kind of getting to a critical point now of being really successful and other technologies like some of our friends here from Netgear are creating that you know allows for a really real world, like merging the real world and the virtual world and you can't tell the difference. You know, we're trying to get there and we're getting there, but I think about the UX in virtual world in the next 10 years. And I don't even think that we've touched on what that's gonna be because there's no money in it now. It would have to be somebody that can wait to make money in 10 years on it, but it's gonna be something like the mouse and keyboard was revolutionary to my experience with the computer and then my kids' experiences now with the touch screens. Um, it's gonna be something pretty spectacular. So I just wanted to throw that out there for any mad scientists that have 10 years to wait to make a bunch of money. It, you know, and it's going to be something very, you know, Matrixy, Minority Report-ish, and I can name a number of other movies, but I won't. Um, this was a really cool project that we did with Samsung. And obviously, sometimes we can name companies, sometimes we can't. Um, but we worked with their Arctic group, and uh, this, was a, this was, a, was a proof of concept. But it turned out to be uh, a fairly, I'm, again, I'm running through this pretty quick, because I think my time is going to come up here. i got, what, two, three more minutes? A little bit more, okay. Um, I'm, I'm getting to a point here. Z-Space, how many people have experienced Z-Space recently? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't, so I'll put my hand down. Like in the last couple of months, has anybody tried it? I'm really impressed with that platform. I started getting to know them when I was at Unity as well. And they were, you know, across the freeway, they were down at 237, and I was puzzled as to why they were focused on the education marketplace, but it was true 3D, you know, the, the space that they've created in their platform is really, really, really cool. And it's super meaningful for education. And it has evolved and it's successful. And they're actually have made a really good business of it. And while we've done a math and a chem app for them, there are a number of others. So I do think that that's a platform, while it's proprietary, to kind of keep an eye on. And I'm actually gonna contact them because I wanna go try it. I haven't done it for probably two years. And I've just heard a lot, a lot of good things about the changes in it. But again, you know, where's the money? You know, and where are we trying to find work? I think training is a really big area for us as well. We're doing a lot of work there, exploring how to make training in VR and XR a lot more meaningful and um, kind of consistent with value that people want. You know, it's one thing to stick an app on and you know cruise around in the go for a little while and go, yeah, it's yeah, it's better than Gear VR, but oh, what's next? Um, although I do, I do give the go a lot of credit. You know, I have to give credit to these bigger companies who create platforms and opportunities for us developers to build things on. Um, there are some really deep areas now that I won't go too too deep into, but but the 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 areas of you know neural networks, a lot of the AI uh, space that we delve in um, isn't quite on the outside of enterprise yet but we do a lot of that work inside um, with enterprise and industry. 
Um, and then all of the collection of data, and you know, there's, a, there's an interesting kind of thought about data because it's just this huge keyword, but what, what is it? What do you do with it? And, well, that's the, that is the key. You know, what you do and synthesize with the data you get, whether it's um, you know, out there ride sharing and the drivers and the riders getting stuff. But I think that um, this is an area, the more that I meet new developers in the Bay Area, probably two out of three are in data. And they're coming out of school and they're training for that in computer science, for data science. Um, you know, language, I mean, voice technology is amazing. My fifth grader locally here in Mountain View did, uh, um, had a hypothesis, it was pretty easy to prove, Alexa's the smartest voice assistant in the consumer marketplace. So we looked at everything across the board and he decided to not use Bixby at the time, although Bixby has now got a great program for anybody that's looking to get into voice technology and a, voice AI, um, there's a beta program at Samsung now. Highly recommend you to just go in. It's like two minutes to apply. You get in, you can build, uh, I think they're called cards, but you can build some applications for them. If you're looking to get some attention in the voice AI work, uh, world, I think that's a, a pretty interesting spot for us for VR as well and AR and XR. Because, you know, when we talk about human-computer interaction, the voice has been overlooked for a decade. You know, it could have been tracking all along with what you see and even, I mean, you know, Fortnite voice isn't different than what, what I did even before that with Unreal Tournament. But the voice technology that we've got now on our phones is super powerful. You know, I didn't realize, you know, you don't need to set this up on the, on the cliff to take a picture uh, of you and your family anymore. You know, you set it up there and you yell to it to take a picture. But the voice technology stuff that we're doing and the work for hire that we're doing in this space you know, is very interesting in terms of the growth. There's, there's a ton of growth there. So again, I would, not, um, I would not think that we won't include that as a component for all the projects that we do that are you know, very XR centric. Um, and you know, again, with, with voice, we've done, there's a couple projects here that we've done, I won't read through this, but um, fairly technical. Um, and natural language processing is, is, is another hot topic now too. We're seeing a lot of out of the country companies coming to the US and looking at the problem that exists with having so many different languages around the world and the inability to kind of consolidate and, and grow experiences across platforms across the world. So we did some projects recently that, that kind of exemplified what that means and, and how to deal with uh, natural language processing. Um, a couple other projects that we've done, mobile fitness, ride sharing tech. You know, Lyft and Uber are very interesting because if you scrape down the ride share component of those, the driver app, the component that actually gives the business to consumer experience could work well with, I mean, how many of us sit on the phone trying to, um, get a new appointment for doctors and dentists. So what if, you know, some of the technology that's out there, um, especially for the immersive technology space, would allow us to be always on, 24 seven, you're connected, and you can do things like practical, you know, appointment making. It's interesting because the duplex, uh, did anybody see, I'm sure everybody watched the IO, Google, voice, duplex, video demo. We won't get into that, but it's a very deep, deep, deep technology that's probably further out than we would think when we see the video. But um, that also is a, you know, a part of the um, experiences that I think we're looking to create more of in XR. A, I, you know, I like AR, VR. I don't know why we have to do XR, but okay, XR, bigger umbrella. Um, you know, we've done work with, with bigger companies, um, but I, I'll, I'll leave you all with, uh, with uh, just a quick moment if anybody has a question. I mean, I really, I feel like we have to help each other. So if there's anything that we can do or I can do to help developers out there, um, network or anything else, feel free to you know take my email. Our CEO is a real friendly guy too, super smart. Um, our team is, we like to keep our team lean and mean, but we still got about 20 base employees and then probably the same amount of contractors. We really like to work with contractors because a lot of you all don't like to be tied down to an employment agreement. Um, but we like to keep domain experts in every area. So if you feel like there's something that you want to do and you're not able to do it or find work, please contact us. Because um, I think Tim is a fabulous guy. And again, with the trust thing, it kind of all comes down to trust. So, and I, I really trust this team. We execute really well on stuff. So are there any questions? And then I'll get, uh, get off the stage. <laughs>
Any questions? Anybody? Did, didn't you guys do something with like a platform? Yeah. Like a haptic platforming thing? Yeah, so um, fictional fictional force is the ride that we have. I'll call it a ride. And it's in it's on the stage in Alameda. And it's uh, it's essentially an X-Wing fighter game where you're sitting on the platform and it's moving and there's a fair amount of haptics and you know kind of sensory stuff happening, sound, rumble, movement. Um, and this is really to showcase you know, what you can do when you put everything together and really kind of create the experience that for all intents and purposes is, is location-based entertainment. You know, when you hear LBE, that's location-based entertainment. It's a growing area. I was sharing with Carl and a few other folks um, I have a lot of friends that are going back to these, these, these retail locations that are open now and doing the rides. I think the problem will become, is there enough content? So we've got to now figure out part of our solution that we're trying to figure out on the stage is, how do you leverage this across the world? You know, you can't really package up what we've got. And nobody, you know, we can't get the world to come to us. So, you know, we're really, as a stunt work studio, trying to figure out some of these things and share these lessons out in the, the marketplace. But um, I would also recommend looking into the LBE um, area for work because there's a lot of contract work in that area too. You know, all these companies, most of the companies you think they do all the work internally and even when they say they do, they don't. They need us. So, um, yeah. Thank you guys for listening. Appreciate it. Did you have a, I have a, yeah, I have a question here. Uh, so for some of these like proof of concept type works with XR, like uh, is, it, is it a challenge to kind of establish yourself to get paid for those types of things. I think a lot of companies that maybe want to tiptoe there, but for a minimum amount of uh, resources, for example, has that been kind of uh, a struggle or has that been easier? Like, how's that experience been, I guess? Uh, That's a great question, because it kind of comes down to, you know, what, what is the value of your, your time as a developer? You know, we, 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 we want work, we want to get paid, but it takes a lot of time to get that relationship, build that trust, and then get a guarantee of some payment. So the way that we look at it is, we really like to understand a client. And we'll, we'll spend time and we'll invest, let's use an example, you know, 10 to 20 hours across the board up front just to get to know what the opportunity may be. And then engaging the stakeholder on the other side, typically it will be um, somebody that's on the outside of that company, you know, producers or, or um, CTOs, people at events um, like this or bigger conferences. And for us to actually get that work, we typically will build some things out to show them that we're capable of doing it. It's tough to swallow because in this day and age, a lot of people take advantage of that model, but it's, it's old school. It's kind of what has to happen. It's what we do and what we'll do is we'll, we'll get to the point where we know, we, we, have a, we have a map from A to Z that we know we want to achieve with this client. So we'll start with A. A is that initial you know, proving to them that we can do it, building that trust. And then the next step is B, you know, what is that POC? What is that, what is that demo or that prototype? And we'll tie that in literally to being potentially a first milestone. But it's got a book cover, right? It can just be this project for them, but we know beyond it, we're gonna take that work and continue to leverage it for that client. If they don't want to, to do anything else, yeah, we don't own IP, we don't own their brand, but we try to keep the technology inside so that we can leverage that to go to then CDEF. But it does take a fair amount of trust, and you've got to build that trust with clients. And it's pretty easy for us to discover, you know, who is real and who isn't. But I would say probably 50% of the time we're doing work for our future and not to get paid because it just turns out they, they don't end up wanting to go past that first milestone. Mm -hmm. Hope that helps. In the back? Yeah, so is there one thing to do with type of deviation? Yes. Given a choice, Well, there is, and it's kind of the opening of the kimono and just saying, look, we are an advanced technology group that can deliver to you a solution for this problem you have now. But we have an understanding that, that what they're try usually trying to solve is the first problem, and there are many others, or it's just the beginning of solving that big problem. So letting them understand we've got a bigger picture, and this is the focus, we'll deliver on this, this is the POC, but should you want to move forward, here are the other channels that we're gonna take and the other things we're gonna be able to do. So it really, it, it kind of is a one trick pony in a way. It's 
we look at the focus and prioritize the focus on that one problem or that one project or POC, but it's in the context of these companies. And that's why we tend to gravitate towards the bigger companies because they tend to have you know, layers like the onion and they peel a layer off. And as soon as we've solved that problem over with a group at Samsung, they love it, but now it has to be leveraged across some other technology that they're not quite finished with. So in some ways it can also be a barb and a hook. If you can find those clients and you can get that one gig and you can build the confidence, they're gonna keep coming back to you for more and more and more. And I think that's why Tim and the crew have excelled at being a wider set of domain experts is because we can conquer a number of different problems within XR. And so that's what excited me about working with, uh, with FS, is that it's, it is kind of a wide gamut of things we do, but it's not that we're a uh, jack of all trades and a pro at none. We have set areas in the width, and we, we can go deep in you know, eight or 10 of those across that width. So thank you again. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, our next speaker is David uh, Elzey from Torque 3. All right, coming on up. Excellent. And uh, while he gets set up, how many folks are here for the first time? First, first time SVGR go. Oh, 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 awesome. Welcome. Crazy. We've been having these for five years. Where have you guys been? <laughs> oh my gosh, so late. Oh my god, lucky to them. No, welcome to SVGR. Um, uh, so this is uh, great. Uh, like I said, the flow of the event, normally you have some uh, presentations and we'll get some time to kind of have some uh, demos and you'll get to kind of talk and meet, so definitely do that uh, while we get these things set up. Awesome. Uh, so here we go. So I've, I've heard of Torque 3D, but not Torque 3, so I'm excited <laughs> to find out what this is about. Oh, my Oh, oh. Here we go. Uh -huh. All right, let's give them a warm welcome. Hey. <laughs> Okay, um, I should probably tell you what we do here. So I'm going to bring up this concept video real quick. And a Torque Free is a fitness and rehabilitation solution that transforms workouts into deeply immersive games you play. So what you're looking at here is our next level of prototype. Uh, so I'm going to actually shut this off because it's just, it, it's not real. <laughs> We're building it. Let's look at what's real. Here I am. This is me uh, a few weeks ago taking a test ride on the proof of concept prototype. I started on the area, you saw three of these other these quadricycles. That's, it's a multiplayer game already. We've been building from the ground up multiplayer, but we only have one platform. So I'm going to go for, I'm going to race my own here on time. One thing you notice here that we're doing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about VR design as we go through this. Um, is the sense of embodiment that you have. Uh, we have an Android that represents your body. Uh, it's scaled to me because you know I'm the primary tester at this point. Uh, but it will scale actually to whoever sits into it at a later point. And what happens here, it, we, don't have, we have audio. Uh, Carl, do we have audio for this? I don't hear it. OK. Uh, well, a little louder, louder, louder. Is, so, it, is it coming out? Yeah, I hear it. It's just not loud enough yet. Uh, I'm afraid almost. it's like really. <laughs> no, no, it'll be fine. It's fine. There we go. Okay. okay. So, we're trying to see it. so we have, uh, so you can see here, if you've been watching why I stopped, I'm on a full motion simulator. In a custom made, incredibly low latency simulator. And the way we're doing this, you can see on the left, the way we're doing this and the way we're adjusting it, even though this insane motion of, you know, sense of motion through here should make everybody absolutely nauseous, uh, we have significantly over, I would say we're up to about 75% of people trying it have none whatsoever. And then we're about 50-50 of the remaining group between mild and severe. So we're pushing that and getting it, closing that gap. We'll never close it all. There's always going to be people who get sick riding in the passenger seat of the car, but, but we're doing, you know, we're getting quite a bit. So something you'll notice here too is I'm coasting right now. The vehicle actually reacts to physics the way you would expect an actual vehicle. We wrote an underlying physics engine in Unreal to handle the level of fidelity that we're actually doing. Uh, we were really saddened to open up Unreal source code and to find out how they're cheating physics for vehicles. 
Um, if you've ever wondered why you're playing a game in Unreal and a vehicle bounces across the terrain randomly, it's because they're not quite doing, I mean, they're not actually following the laws of physics on their own vehicles. They're riding, they got a lot of cheats. So my software engineer decided that was not going to work for us ever, and he's right. So uh, we painfully are building it up step by step um, on the physics. So the vehicle has inertia, uh, you know, we have gravity, inertia, mass, etc. cetera. Uh, we have rolling resistance, the tire patch changes sizes. Uh, each texture, of course, has its own friction. So, uh, and, you know, in the addition here, we're uh, shifting gears. So the, what we have here on the pedals is we're actually using motors for resistance. So uh, they're incredibly precise because there's no mechanical function. If we tell it 60 times a second, we tell it to do something different, it responds for all practical purposes instantly. All right? And there's obviously some micro latency involved in electrical signal. But so there's no latency. So exactly when you expect to feel something, it happens. And this is really, really important when you're in contact with the ground with local motion. Something that VR doesn't do, or actually any gaming does. You don't get to control your own local motion. And that's the problem we've seen with uh, treadmills of all kinds, is the latency and you don't feel it. So we cheated. We decided that it can't be solved, but I can't have you walk around. I can't have you ride a regular bicycle. We decided to change it to what we could do. I can put you in certain vehicles, a quadricycle being one of them, and that vehicle I can create, let you interact with the rest of the world. So. As I'm riding, I actually feel the ground through the pedals, the steering blades, as well as the motion stem. There's motors, actually you can see them right here, that are driving the steering blades. So it's, I hate to call it force feedback or haptics because it's actually just simulation. We're just saying exactly what is happening on the force load of the tires. On the steering, it's actually detecting side force load as its primary feedback mechanism. So it makes for a, yeah, this is fun. <laughs> and I'm still sad we don't have the whooshing sounds as they go by. But uh, the, um, so what we really thought of, we don't consider ourselves a VR company. We consider ourselves an immersive technology company. This is immersive technology. VR is one component of it. We just happen to be a very important component because visual, we all have a benchmark on visually what we see. And it's difficult to make this visual work. I'm getting tired now in the video. I <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, I, this was, I kept trying to do as fast as I could on these video tags, like all the cameras aimed at me, and then um, uh, I, did, I kept wrecking, and it would, of course, would kill the time. And I'm trying to make a faster video without speeding it up. Um, so I was already tired by this point. So, anyhow, uh, this is going to continue on, um, but. Uh, realistically speaking, I, you know, we're just going to be watching a video and I can prattle on about what we're doing. But I think you guys might have some questions. What's your question? Um, what would happen if the logs, if, you, if one of the logs actually hit it you? It depends. Uh, sometimes it just smacks you, sometimes <laughs> it flips you over. When the, and it does that, then the game resets you. Uh, I've had it cram me into the crane where I've been jammed into the crane and it kept coming back and hitting me over and over. That was fun. Um, I couldn't get out and I was just like, no, whack. And the other guys were laughing and I was going, reset me. No, we're going to watch. So, um, so yeah, it, it, and if you fall off or anything, uh, if, if you exceed the rotational limits of the motion sim, we fade you to black and reset you at the last checkpoint So in this prototype. Yeah. Uh, so for, I guess the aim of this is this uh, VR fitness, is this kind of location-based entertainment or kind of uh, maybe uh, have a kind of a broad approach like, hey, we can do a lot of things just layer, depending on the content you layer on top or our, kind of what do you have in mind? Our business model is based off of fitness and rehabilitation. We get into some really cool rehab, uh, why this is awesome for rehab and why we built it that way from the ground up. But. Um, as far as the fitness side, it's uh, come play, and uh, fitness is a byproduct, just like real play. If you really went out and did something, you're not really doing it. I mean, you may tell yourself you're doing it fitness, but you, if you keep doing it, you're doing it because you enjoy it, it's fun, it's habit for you. Now, the rehab side of that, real quick, um, without getting into much of our secret sauce, 
is because we use motors and because it's all computer controlled, um, we can handle people and give them a smooth experience um, even if they are uh, weakened, say they have a, a neural realization, they've had a stroke or brain injury, <clears throat> that's the way it looks like when they pedal, um, we can compensate and make it smooth. So they can, they can rehabilitate faster than also using a highly, you know, this really intense environment is telling the brain to play. Your brain's in play mode, it learns faster, it rewires the circuit. Same thing though, if you were just rehabbing physical stuff, um, we, VR is amazing for pain management. And then we can also allocate asymmetrically the amount of force to whatever part of your body needs to be protected from overexertion while you work out. Um, other questions? Okay. So yeah, who are, who are some of your you know, target customers now? For our target customers, uh, we have a consumer fitness market. We have a whole business plan that I'm sure for everybody here. But, but uh, also uh, the military is interested in us. And um, then uh, just institutional rehabilitation uh, markets also. Is it, uh, so you guys build the hardware and the software. So is it a unit that you sell? Is that? Is that a lease, yeah. Yeah, a lease, oh, okay. For, well, for the military and for the uh, rehabilitation, be a lease for consumers, it would be pay as you go. Essentially, if you were, if you were one of our customers, you'd have the app, you'd schedule a session at the lo uh, local place, um, this down there's awesome. You sli you're actually sliding sideways through most of this, so. Um, as you can see, me gripping um, as I'm going too fast. But so you guys are opening up locations then? Uh, yeah, it'll be a studio partner program. Oh, yeah. Where you'll go to, it. it'll be like LVE, but for fitness. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Whereabouts? Hey, what? Where? Where? Uh, well, I would imagine here would be one place. It would be in the Bay Area, but then, uh, in, you know, global eventually. So. Oh, yeah. oh I'm, I'll be here after. I'll be here for questions. Uh, one thing I would like to talk to everybody is, do uh, we have any Unreal developers in here? At all? Okay, Unreal developers, if you're looking for work, uh, we're going to be scaling up in the next few months. I'd love to get your information if you're interested in working on this kind of crazy project. Um, uh, we, we definitely are going to be building lots of stuff. As far as the rest of like game development is concerned, after building our core set of games, uh, we will be then, and then getting an install base, uh, we'll be looking to have independent studios come to us and um, we'll do profit sharing. Well, basically we'll charge our customers extra for premium games and that all of that goes to the developer to put it together. We provide the game development kit and support that um, and then they do what they're gonna do. As long as we approve the game for our platform, then it's good to go. So we essentially become like a publisher for our own product. And the bike activity, is, there, is, there, is the bike mechanic the core of the action or are you guys building that out to be other activity? Uh, right now, um, we have planned for our core set of games uh, three what we call paradigms. The first is a quadricycle, and on the quadricycle you have three uh, um, major game modes. One is racing, another one's explore, think of like geocaching um, mm -hmm. through big vast areas. The beautiful of that one is you can, not, you can just save game wherever you ended up in your session and come back, start there again. Uh, the last one will be battle mode for you know first person shooter in that with armored and guns and stuff. Uh, then the same type of modes for three different paradigms, uh, um, pedal powered flight, like biplane type stuff, where we can make it feel real. It's important we make it, your brain has to look at this paradigm and accept that this is possible. You can't say, pedal a spacecraft around and make your brain think that. The second, uh, the third will be, uh, is uh, submersible. Uh, pedal powered submersibles where you're, you got the prop and the fins and stuff, sort of like the, I don't know you saw the, the deep sea thing they used to make where it wasn't really pressurized and it sat in a scuba suit and it yeah. was like an underwater jet, something similar to that. But then we get to give her different heavier fluid dynamics and currents and fun stuff like that underwater. Mm -hmm. And again, same three modes, racing, explore, and uh, um, battle mode. So those are the core set of games we have planned, but we have a game, de uh, uh, a game development kit that has all of our stuff in Unreal in plug-in form. So it'll work, and you can make your own paradigm. So just get in there and start working with it. Yeah? So two, uh, two kind of related questions. So you, you mentioned that um, you're not satisfied with the fake game that was in Unreal Engine, and, uh, or your software engineer you said was not. Um, you said you guys like to have one in your own more realistic. And we're, we're undermining it slowly but surely, but yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah, so. um,
Yeah, we, we, we are uh, sacrificing the physics chip to make it work, so there'll be no uh, ragdoll. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So uh, there, there were reasons they did what they did. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, they just can't handle it. So um, we're subdividing the physics thing. Our biggest problem is, is uh, one of our big problems is right now we're using HD5, it's 90 frames a second. Sorry if this is too much of a tech discussion, but 90 frames a second and the, GP, and the physics chip is based on frames. So we've gone in and written it, so we, we, we've, it's done, even though we're sub-stepping it, it's, it's ignoring it at this point. It's ignoring the sub-stepping. It just can't handle it. So we're stuck at this level of fidelity at, without getting more frames. And what we, what our next tax is to build a fake emulator to talk to the physics chip at a higher frame rate before we send it to, to, to the Vive, which, and then sync that up, which is, you know, joy. So, but, but that will get us a better, you know, right now, um, this is amazing, uh, but I believe that we would like to, over time, um, push past that if the headsets don't give us higher frame rates. So, um, do a slight faster. <laughs> I have a question about the, are you guys using loaders or are you guys using electromagnetic brakes? No, servo motors. Okay. So we're using uh, servo motors uh, that we've written, we've, well, we've, uh, we've uh, cut and have a custom control board speaking to them, and then we've written software to talk to that. So uh, I would say it's really pretty good on the torque that for the, for the pedals right now. It's pretty amazing. Um, uh, the uh, I don't want to get too technical, but the side, but for the steering, um, we, we have a bit to ride on. Outside okay, no, I was just thinking that the electromagnetic brakes, like, it, you can cut a, it, it'll stop a lot of torque. I mean, you can get the wheels to actually like lock up and. Yeah, yeah it, it, they're they're strong. They're not as strong as you think. Um, there's there's gearboxes attached to them. Yes, I, granted that thing can, but it's got a ten to one gearbox on it, so it's so it's it's much stronger uh, than it, than uh, after the gearbox. Um, so. Uh, but we end up making, it, the fun things about uh, having a motor like that is you just made a bunch of generators, or made a primary generator, so you have to get rid of the electricity somehow. Well, that's what I was going to say. So like, have fun, that it, was it, it's, a, it, um, it's just one, so you, you can play with them, and uh, I mean, it's a lot of torque. I mean, it'll, it, it'll instantly stop whatever you're trying to do. Uh, it's large, well, they do make large enough ones, but then we need to make it small enough, economical enough to put in here, so there's, there's and smart enough. The big ones aren't smart. Um, so, without us doing a ton of work to make them smart, um, you know, we're sort of buying smart ones and working with them, but the, but yeah, but it is fun getting rid of that much electricity. You'd be surprised how much it is. So, it's, uh, the amount of capacitors sitting over on the side is frightening. Uh, they're just sucking up, the, <laughs> sucking it up and dispersing it as heat. So, um, your question. I, I just wanted to, to know how, how much in body do you really feel in that kind of setup? I know VR, it's gotten better and better, um, but I just want to feel like it's hard. I need to be, I mean, VR veterans are better for this, but even I get them. Um, for example, uh, uh, a downhill, if you start to slide sideways uh, on the downhill, you see, it will. I mean, it's four wheels, and it start, it'll lift up on two. Um, I have people, including myself, will stick a leg out to keep themselves from flipping <laughs> over. Um, I, uh, um, the narrow cliff. There's a rounded rock up there that was actually an accident when it happened, but we kept it. And when you go around it, if you're too close to the edge, which is really easy to happen, um, you feel the back end sliding off. I mean, it feels like it's really happening. Even though you can't see, it's not visual. You feel it. You feel the motion, that, that little bit, and you feel the tire sliding because you're, you're, you know, it's slipping. You can tell it's slipping because it's got a little chatter to it, and it's, and it's, uh, and it's not moving you forward as fast as you're pedaling. <laughs> so you've got this little, then everybody's, you know, you just like, well, my eyes are big. I can't see everybody else because they're in a headset, but they're like, ah, you can hear, you see them tense up and their body in motion as they come out of it. So I can't say, uh, everybody says it's, you know, it, yeah, um, it still feels real to me and I ride all the time, you know, um, but it's hard to tell uh, because a lot of people really don't have a deeply immersed experience background. And so they're so blown away their first ride that I don't really know how much detail there's. Whereas I'm hitting something and I'm immediately thinking, did it react exactly when I changed angle? Or is the axis off or something? And my, that's the way my brain's working as I'm going through it. And I'm still impressing myself, so I guess we're close. But I'm not at that, I'm still being very critical of the mechanics of it at this point. And then I watch other people and I don't think that they're, but just, everybody tried VR for the first time, they were like, oh wow. And then the 20th time, like, you know, it's okay. 
unless it's a really crazy experience. Well, I don't have the depth of people using it over and over again that are not associate, closely associated to the project so that they've now sort of become uh, not a good sample. No, let, let us know if you need any more samples. I need lot, <laughs> actually, you know what? I need lots of samples. So anybody who wants to, she's, I, they probably put some with it. <laughs> we, just can't, we just can't compress it anymore. Um, also, actually, yeah, scale is an issue with us. Uh, five foot eleven is perfect for us, and then we, and then it gets, it, it works. But it, 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 as we get away from the sweet spot, until we do more work, it, it's uh, more challenging for us. So mm -hmm. I'm up slightly above the sweet spot. There, most people are, you know, right at, around the sweet spot. So um, it is better. Yeah. Uh, it has air. Yeah, it, it has a. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll show you the design. Even the prototype has air. But you can see here, there's upper air and lower air, and they're spaced evenly, uh, dual di uh, diffusers, so that it will, be a, um, it will feel as one constant rush. So we have air right now, and it is associated with the speed. Um, with, the, uh, with the proof of concept, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a bit of bailing wire, duct tape type of rig. Um, Hold on a second, let me get, where did my mouth go? Okay, so, well you can see it right there between my legs, just the, right there in the center, right there. So if you can see right here. So when you're going down the hill at like 25 and that thing's on full blast, it is amazing. Because you're usually sweaty by then because you've gone up long switchbacks. So it's amazing to have all that air rush over you while you relax down the hill, just like in real life. So. Uh, we we want it, air is an important part of our sweat management so uh, for, work, for doing this because in the real world you sweat when you exert yourself so you, we need a way to start countering that although people are still dripping when they get off of the stage so. anything else yeah in the back I can't hear it you, oh how we doing sweat well right now we are doing for I'm sorry, I'm going to pause it. So, so right now, um, we're just swapping out between people, uh, the, the thing. But in the future, they'll, we'll actually, they'll, uh, we won't use the uh, facial interface that they have. Um, we'll have like almost like a surgeon's mask, but it goes over here, and a terry cloth one. And then when you pull over the VR headset, it will stick to that. And the VR headset will be vented. Because we're location-based, we get to control the lighting. So light leakage is not a concern. So there'll be slight vents, and we have wind, so it will feel natural to have wind come in through the scoop, scoop through the bottom, and then exit through the top. Of course, natural heating will exit. It's humidity that really our enemy. It's not, it's not heat in the face. It's the humidity, obviously, for fogging up. So, uh, so you will have constant airflow through without a real problem with light leakage. So, yeah. Like what, what, what is the helmet for? Uh, well, we're agnostic. We're just we're we're monitoring technologies we go through, uh, whatever we can support. But this is actually on a pretty moderate computer, a uh, single GPU computer, and it's running a pretty good environment, as you can see. Um, we're tempted to really bump it up to dual GPU and see what we can do with the environments, because we know that that'll be where the future is. And the future will be. Well, we've sort of done the numbers now, and the computing cost is not our problem. So in, in getting these out there, we can, we can go and we can buy the components in mass, and we can get this out there. Um, so we're going to ease up on our restrictions on the computer and make our environments look a lot better. Um, but as far as the headsets are concerned, um, I'm wearing talks with a few people that are building stuff under the radar. But, you know, right now I would throw, I would get ready to throw a Vive Pro on there, you know? Baby steps for us. Have to modify it for the vents and stuff. Uh, here's our problem. Okay. Uh, to say okay, so you're on a full motion platform, which means that when I turn right, it slides me to the right and leans me to the left. Mm -hmm. and, but Most give me G forces, right? So I feel like I'm being pulled this way because I'm turning this way. Mm -hmm. But if I did that, the VR looks like this. Right, because you're like this, so uh, we can't do that because we have to stay. Your orientation has to stay with the vehicle. So we wrote, we have compensation, VR compensation software that precedes the video going out and <coughs> says, 
is this motion being happening because of move, vehicle movement or is it happening because of g-force? And if it's not g-force, we remove it, that the angle that's going to the motion sim from what's being tracked in the VR headset. That's fun. So, uh, so that, that way it all looks right. You'll notice when I'm driving around, going around a corner, I don't like all of a sudden get my single walking, you know, um, because I'm, because it would actually lean me like over here. If I'm not running the VR comp, it, it goes crazy because my head goes woo and leans over here because that's the way it's rotating me. Um, so it looks pretty crazy, so yeah. Oh yeah, we have, we definitely have the lineage of the uh, specialists who have been helping us prep it, and it's okay. Good. Yeah, it's, it's I can't wait to actually the next version, uh, the P2. We're going to actually start our testing. Um, this one isn't really reliable enough, so I'd be afraid that if they started if they started a treatment that they wouldn't be able to finish it, um, or we'd have to tell them no. And we don't want that. So, but yeah, it's, it does things that simply aren't on the market right now. So it's really cool. Yeah, I just I mean. I, I, it's like no shortage of people who are willing to guinea pig this thing, you know, who have not are not getting. I know one of them is a friend, my dad's friend, so I'm sure he'll make it in the in the cut. But he uh, he's two years we've been doing rehab um, from a uh, blockage, and um, his uh, he's still one leg and one arm are just not there. And I, you can go. We did the Q and A, and it's treadmills and bicycles, stationary bikes and stuff like that, and a coach. It's the worst possible environment. I mean, you could you can put somebody in. It will eventually work someday, probably. But that's not you know. It, there's an order of magnitude when you stimulate the brain uh, from routine to something new. If it has to learn this, it will also learn other things. It will rewire. So while it's learning, it's rewiring your brain to learn how to control this vehicle. It'll also rewire your brain to make your leg move at the same time. That's how. That's how we work. We don't work in routine. We don't learn anything in routine. We learn things through stimulation. And unfortunately, if, you, if you're you know, a therapist and you've got a swarm of people coming in one after another, you, in the tools you have are the tools you have. So it's not their fault, but it's just what they have. So. Cool, the bubba okay. wraps up for time. But yeah, <laughs> Excellence. Uh, all right, at this point, we are one and one with the community announcement. Come on up. Uh, you have uh, about 60 to se 60 seconds or so to let us know what you're doing or working on if you have an announcement of some kind. Anybody? Anybody not announcing? Um, I'll, uh, I'll announce the thing. Hey, I'm Bruce. I'm with 60.ai. We have uh, beta. For our AR Madness platform, I also have the uh, a demo here. I have a phone with the uh, meshing and occlusion AR demos if you want to check those out. So I'll have those going. Uh, so there. Hey, Shannon, totally what's happening? That out. I'm in that program too. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so one of my little side uh, projects uh, you guys may have heard about, I don't think I actually announced it yet. It's called Mars VR. Uh, have I talked about that here? No? Okay, so go to marsvr.io. And it's, it's a project uh, sponsored by the, the Mars Society. And uh, we recently flew out to, uh, to Idaho uh, to scan the Mars Desert Research Station. So it's a little over a square mile. It's actually like a mile and a half of actual physical terrain. We had a fleet of, of drones and uh, Oz uh, Balabanian, you may know him. He's a pretty well-known uh, photogrammetry guy was out there and we scanned the inside and the outside of this uh, desert research station, which is effectively where uh, citizen astronauts go to train. And we're building a platform which is a VR training platform for the uh, people to go and try. I mean, when they go there, they actually wear spacesuits, they go through airlocks, they, they really simulate being life on Mars. So point being and to this to this audience and uh, to high fidelity uh, audience is that this is going to be opened up as, a, as an open source project once we have the, the, the terrain data in and the, and the buildings in for anybody to develop um, missions so training missions like the first one we're going to do is you know how to get in a spacesuit 
and the second one will be how to clear the airlock. And, but then we need a, you know, a bunch of community uh, contributions for people to, to build uh, emissions moving forward. So anyway, check it out. Still, we're still doing the, the scans and stitching things together. I don't know that anybody's ever done a, a landscape this big uh, with photogrammetry at this level of detail, but it's somewhat impossible, but we're, we're making progress. So anyway, marsvr.io. Everyone, my name is uh, James Bequanu. I work for uh, Genesis VR, uh, but I also uh, volunteer for the Internet Archive. And uh, this month, uh, end of this month, they're going to be putting together a uh, decentralized web summit at uh, the San Francisco Mint. Um, so, you know, anyone who wants to uh, go learn about decentralized uh, web and decentralized web VR as well uh, will be there. And uh, yeah, hope to see you there. Nice. Nice.